Church of the City. Let's all stand up. How's everyone doing? Woo! Lord Jesus, have your way this morning. May you be lifted up higher than any name.
Well, you guys may be seated, and if you will get your communion elements, which will be in those little holders beside your seat, then we're going to participate in communion together, which we do every week here at Church of the City. And as I was thinking about today and communion, I just had this concept of crossroads that kept being on my mind and my heart. In this room today, it is impossible that there are not thousands of crossroads represented. For some of us, it may be things that have come into our lives, maybe just recently, that we were not expecting, we were not planning for, we're not actually sure what to do about their sudden entrance into our lives. Maybe it's a difficult situation or a difficult relationship or a diagnosis or something similar. And those crossroads require so much prayer and wisdom and discernment from the Lord as we figure out how to navigate them. But there are other crossroads represented in the room today, and those are crossroads of obedience where we have two paths in front of us. And one, we know what the Lord is asking us to do, and that's that path. And in the other path is the option to just delay obeying. Because to obey might be difficult or bring pain. And I was at one of these crossroads in my life recently, and I was in counseling as I am regularly. And so I just poured it all out to my counselor. I was like, here's the deal. Here's all the details. Here's how this is affecting my life. Here's how I feel. I have so many feelings and just poured it all out. And when I got done, she said, so what can you do? And I said, well, option one is that I can engage the way God's asking me to and trust that he's going to provide me with the wisdom and discernment that I need and the words that I need and I can lean in and I can do what he's asking me to do, to do even though I risk pain if I do that. And she said, yeah, or, and I said, or, I'm so glad you asked. I was thinking that I could learn the moonwalk and I could perfect that to the point that I can just dance my way right out of this situation and not have to do anything. She said, that's fair. She said, when you look back on this decision, because every crossroads is something we're eventually gonna look back on, you know? She said, when you look back on this decision, which decision most accurately reflects your integrity and the kind of person that you want to be and the kind of character you want to have? And I said, look here, lady. I don't pay you to ask me questions that are going to make me all uncomfortable, okay? I pay you for me to come in here and dump all my stuff and for you to go, oh, Shannon, bless you. That must be so painful. How can I make you feel better, right? I didn't say that. I said, I know you're right. And I also know what I always told my children as they were growing up, which is delayed obedience is disobedience. So my question for you today is, what's your crossroad? What's God asking of you? And you have two options. One is obey, the other is delay which is to disobey. And when we come to the Lord's table and we participate in communion, scripture's clear that we're to search ourselves before we do that. And we're to see if there's any offensive way in us and if there's any area in which we know to obey and we're saying, I'm gonna take another way. And even this representation of communion is amazing and meets us right at this juncture because when Jesus sat down for this meal with his disciples, he was at a crossroads. Am I going to do what the Father has put me here to do or am I going to see if there's another way? And he would go to Gethsemane shortly after this meal and say, Heavenly Father, if there is any other way, would you please let me not have to do this? But... I will do 
your will and not my own. And the reason you and I can sit here today and we can participate in this sacrament and we can even make decisions at crossroads is because Jesus said yes to what his father was asking him. So will you say yes today to what your heavenly father is asking you? I'm gonna ask you just to take a minute and to say, Holy Spirit, will you reveal any place I'm not saying yes to you? Jesus, yes, was a painful one. Hebrews 12 says that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. Jesus, yes, didn't make the cross hurt less. There was pain in that offering. And there may be pain for you and for me as we obey, but we have a joy set before us too, that one day we're gonna see Jesus face to face and there will be no more pain, there will be no more tears, there will be no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more death. But there may be pain in the offering today as we say yes, following the example of our Savior. So take a minute with you and the Spirit and ask if there's anything in you that needs to stop the delay and just obey. Would you stand together? So at that meal with his disciples, Jesus gave a foretaste of his yes. When he took bread and he broke it, and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he gave a foretaste of his yes again when he said, this is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, it's hard to say yes sometimes to what you're asking. But thank you for the example of Jesus and the grace that you give us that even when the yes costs us infinitely, we can obey because of the joy set before us. You are a good and faithful God. And we want to stand in that goodness and faithfulness today and worship you that you made a way for us to be with you forever. May we never get over it. And it's in your son's name that we pray, amen. Would you stay standing and we're gonna worship just a little bit more. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake, Till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness. All my life, and all my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so, so.
pray together. Surely the goodness of God will follow us all the days of our lives and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God, we consciously bring our presence into your presence. We consciously come into your presence now, God. We confess we are a distracted people. And so we ask God that you would arrest our attention, that you would give us eyes to see and is to hear what your spirit would say to us today. We are fully present in your presence. And God, I do pray for those who are at a crossroad in their lives. We've just sung that all my life you've been faithful and I pray God that those who are worried, those who are concerned about what is to come I pray that the words all my life you've been faithful would be washing over them right now and bolstering them and strengthening them and giving them confidence in the Lord. 
Lord, I pray that you would give guidance and you would give direction for those who are wrestling with a decision right now. For those who have a choice to make, I pray God that you would speak to them. I pray that they would hear your voice and you would find them obeying you. Thank you, God, that we can gather together and we can lift our voices as one in unity and be reminded of the goodness of God and the promises of God and the faithfulness of God. So may you receive our worship. We offer it to you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all God's people said, amen, amen. Can we thank the team for leading us? All right, why don't you greet one another and you can go ahead and you can take your seats. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Darren Whitehead. If we have not had a chance to meet, I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, I wanna say a special welcome to those of you who've been watching online for a long time, it's good to have you in the house. And good morning to those of you who are watching online for legitimate reasons. Um, we're glad to have you here. Um, this is gonna be a great day uh, gathered together. Um, a couple of things before we jump into God's Word. Just a few things going on in the life of our church, and you can get all this information by scanning the QR code at the bottom of each of your seats. There's a little card down there, you can scan that. Uh, all the info I'm about to give you uh, and next steps are uh, recorded there. If you would like to worship through giving, uh, you can do that by going to cotc.com give, or you can give as you are leaving, and uh, we are very grateful for the heart of generosity that is so pervasive in our church, uh, just you're among a generous people. We are right in the middle of planning our Christmas Eve services. We are gonna do six identical back-to-back -back Christmas Eve services. And um, the team uh, have been working like crazy on the creative elements. And I know a bunch of you are gonna bring family and friends and all of that. But part of it is gonna be two different choirs. We are gonna have an adult choir and then we're gonna have a student choir. Student choir is ages uh, 10 through 18. And we need people to join our choir. So uh, if you would like to be a part of that, we would love to have you be on the team with us as we are uh, putting on all of these services. Uh, you can go on to, uh, you can scan the QR code or you can go onto our website, cotc.com and, uh, and you can sign up and be a part of the choir and join us as uh, we celebrate the incarnation at Christmas time. All right, uh, we have a stakeholders course that's coming up. Stakeholders are what we call the members around here. If you are wanting to join our church or you're wanting to learn more about what it means to join our church family, uh, you can go cotc.com slash stakeholders. Our next one's coming up on November the 6th. We have a bunch of new community groups that have just started. If you would like to join a community group, we would love to have you participate in the life of our church through our community groups. It's where we really, uh, we really uh, start to serve and go deeper in scripture with one another. Uh, you can do that by going online as well or scanning the code. On Wednesdays, just to remind you, we have a prayer meeting on Wednesdays at noon called Noonday Prayer. And uh, we spend an hour worshiping and praying together uh, here on, on uh, our campus here down in the theater. We'd love to have you join us. And then finally, today is the day that we've been anticipating for some time because it's going to be our first ever village food market. Now, we are partnering with one of our missional partners named Corner to Corner, and they do a program called the Academy. And what they do is they train uh, mainly younger people from under-resourced communities who are budding entrepreneurs, and they train them and they help resource them as they start their own brand new businesses. And today, we have 15 of these brand new businesses that are all around food. And we as a church get to support these brand new budding entrepreneurs. Isn't this cool? It's gonna be so fun. Now, this is the pilot of so much more that we're gonna be doing uh, when we've fully built out the village and the outdoor food court and all of that. But this is an opportunity for us, we're gonna be eating every anyway. So instead of 
you know, going to P.F. Chang's, you are going to be able to eat out here and we're going to be able to support these new entrepreneurs and bless them and let them know that we believe in them. Uh, if you have kids in Kid City, you need to get them first, okay? You can't just leave them there, all right? <laughs> so get them first and then let's head out onto the East Lawn and uh, there's room for hundreds of people to sit down and to eat and like, let's just hang out together and let's do good in our community and, uh, and have lunch together. This is the pilot. So if logistically some of the things don't work as well as, um, you know, they, work, they, they may in the future, you may be standing in line, some people may run out of food, like this is our first effort. Uh, I would, uh, if, if you have some concerns, I would revert you back to a few weeks ago on the do not complain message, okay? <laughs> So we're going to line up, we're going to support these businesses, and it's going to be a great time together. All right, if you would turn in your Bibles to Philippians 3 and get out your formation journal, today we are going to hear from our newest area pastor. Sean Groves oversees the West Franklin area. Many of you had a chance to meet him. Sean and I have been friends for more than 20 years. And for the last 17 years, Sean has been working with Compassion International, traveling around the nation and, and inspiring people, one of the primary voices of this organization, inspiring people to contend on behalf of some of the poorest communities around the world. And uh, you're really going to enjoy this talk and his take on Philippians 3. So would you please give, for the very first time teaching in our church, would you please give Pastor Sean Groves a warm <laughs> welcome. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, Darren and I, we go way back. Uh, my wife, Becky, and I, we moved here in 1997. And then in 98, Derek, uh, I mean, Darren, uh, came to the church, began working with the youth. And, uh, you know, uh, I'd never seen anything like it. He had such an exotic, beautiful accent and the most amazing hairstyle. It was spiky with frosted tips. And I knew that I could never master um, the accent, but... Uh, but the hair, man, I nailed it. I nailed that. It was, I got it. I totally nailed that. Let's take you, uh, take you way back there. Yes, wow, on the front row. Thank you, sir, uh, for your ministry of encouragement. I really appreciate that. Yeah, we've known each other a long time. We have a lot in common, for starters. Our wives are clearly saints and maybe also visually impaired. We're not sure, but we're grateful for them. Um, so thank you, Darren, for the honor of being able to, to preach for the first time. Anything that I mess up, you get to fix next week. You have plenty of time uh, next week. Hey, would you guys please stand for the reading of God's word? Philippians chapter three, verses one through 11. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. God, as we open your word, we open our hearts and our minds and our lives to you, and we ask for a revelation of you, not a revelation of me. God, you know what we need before we ask for it. You know where we hurt. You know where we are confused. You know where we are doubting. You know what we are facing. You know what we are celebrating. God, speak to each one of us in a unique way. God, we want to hear from you. We desperately need to hear from you. 
We ask you to glorify yourself in this place this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can take a seat. A few years ago, the Washington Post conducted an unusual experiment in the subway of Washington, D.C. They hired world-renowned violinist Joshua Bell to perform an early morning rush hour concert deep in the bowels of the subway system. He began his, uh, his, his concert showing up with just a baseball cap, jeans, a t-shirt, and some tennis shoes. Didn't look world-renowned at all, but he pulled out of his violin case a violin handcrafted in 1713 by the master craftsman Antonio Stradivari. Joshua began his rush hour concert that morning by playing a portion of Bach's partita number two in D minor, you know, it's a banger if you don't know it. It's really good. <laughs> and so for 45 minutes, the world's finest musician played one of the greatest compositions on one of the most exquisite instruments ever crafted. And did anyone notice? Of the 1,100 people that passed by Joshua Bell that morning, only seven stopped to listen. A few, feeling sorry for the guy in the jeans and the ball cap, just, you know, playing the violin, threw a few bucks into his case, earning Joshua Bell $32. Now, the night before, Joshua Bell sold out the Boston Symphony Hall, the cheapest seats in the place, the nosebleeds, the blocked view seats. They went for $100 a piece. And that night, Joshua Bell earned $1,000 per minute. Now, it's not that the people in the subway didn't value great musicians or great music or great instruments. It's just that no one expected to see a great musician playing great music on a great instrument in a place like that. Joshua Bell's most ardent fans would have definitely recognized him and appreciated what he brought in that concert, but they weren't there. The Washington Post noted that his fans used to spending hundreds of dollars to crowd with other fans into amazing rooms to spend time with Joshua Bell are not the kind of people that take public transportation. They don't cram into smelly, crowded subway stations at 6 a.m. Joshua Bell's people avoid places like that. This morning, Paul wants us to discover the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, a Christ that we can only know if we're willing to go to the places that we most want to avoid. He starts out in verse one, rejoice in the Lord. Now to understand why this is so radical, why this is, this is such an amazing way to begin, we need to understand something about the city of Philippi. Philippi was the capital of Macedonia. It was a colony of the Roman Empire, and it was built to embody the values of Rome. So Paul helped plant Philippi. This church was full of his friends, people he considered family. And so he wrote to them, preserving their soul, encouraging them to not embody the values of Rome, but the values of Christ, to not live as good citizens of the empire, but as faithful citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And so he begins, rejoice in the Lord. Now, rejoice is a common refrain in this letter to the Philippians. Nine times Paul tells his friends to rejoice, but this is the only time in the whole letter that he says rejoice in the Lord. Why rejoice in the Lord in this circumstance? He's trying to tell these Romans, living in a, these Christians living in a Roman society, that rejoiced in good government and economic prosperity and luxury and privileges of Roman citizenship and personal accomplishment and education and achievement, who they're rejoicing in Rome. He says, rejoice instead in the Lord. This would cut across the values of the Roman Empire, but it also cut against the values of a small, contentious group of people known as the Judaizers. See, at this time in Christian history, the church was mostly made up of Jews who had come to the realization that Jesus really was the long-awaited Messiah. 
But more and more non-Jews, Gentiles, were also becoming followers of Jesus. And these two groups, the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians, were beginning to clash. And among the Jewish Christians was this particularly pernicious, aggressive group called the Judaizers. And they traveled this evangelistic horde going from Gentile church to Gentile church, telling the Gentile Christians that Jesus is not enough. If you want to have the fullest and most, most faithful Christian life, you also need to become a Jew by being circumcised. They valued their Jewish citizenship and traditions so much that they made them a requirement for being a citizen of heaven. And so Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. This will cut against the Roman values. It will cut against the Judaizer values. And he has harsh words for the Judaizers. Let's look at those words. It's actually even more severe than comes across in the translation we're using today because in the original Greek, Paul says the word beware before each insult. It's beware and then insult and beware and then insult and then beware and then insult. And so it would read something like this in verse two. Beware those dogs. Beware those evil doers. Beware those mutilators of the flesh. Got us pause and just thank Darren for giving me this particular text. It's my first time to preach here. Thanks a lot. Thanks, I appreciate that, buddy. That's great. So dogs. Dogs is a racial slur. Uh, some Jews, not most, but some Jews look, look down on their Gentile, um, Gentile neighbors so much that they dehumanized them and called them dogs. Not pet dogs, not cute little precious dogs, but these are wild animals. In the ancient world, these would be savage, snarling, roaming beasts, digging into the trash, eating scraps. Secondly, he says, beware the evildoers. These poor Judaizers, they believe that they're doing good work. They're trying to help these Gentiles have the fullest and most faithful Christian experience. And Paul says, no, you've got it backwards. You're working evil. Lastly, beware mutilators of the flesh. This is my favorite. And this is the insult. This is the knockout punch at the end. The word for circumcision in Greek is peritome. Peritome means to cut around. But here he uses the word katatome. It's a play on words. It's translated mutilation, but it means to cut down or to cut into pieces. And Paul is saying, I know you think you're doing good, Judaizers. But when you you require your Gentile brothers and sisters to also become Jewish before having the fullest and most faithful Christian life, you are, by asking them to cut around, you are cutting them down, and you are cutting to pieces the very body of Christ. Now, I've only been on staff here for six months. I've met dozens and dozens of you. We've had many conversations about many things. Not once has anyone suggested to me that we make circumcision a requirement for the Christian life. No one has said, hey, how about this, Sean? A stakeholder class followed by circumcision station. How about that? Right? Or, or baptism, and then I got it. And then a circumcision area, right? No one has come to me with that idea. No one here this morning is thinking circumcision should be a requirement for the fullest and most faithful Christian life. But what about marriage? The number of single brothers and sisters in our church who have told me, sometimes with tears in their eyes, that they feel sometimes like second-class citizens, that we so idolize marriage in our society that that has leached into the church, and that sometimes they feel that if they don't have a ring in their finger, it doesn't matter if they have Jesus in their heart, they're not living the most faithful and full Christian life. What about kids? Some people in this church have sat across a cup of coffee with me and have lamented that they don't want to have kids or that they can't yet have kids. And they feel like because of that, that people think that they are somehow second class, that they are not having the fullest and most faithful Christian experience. What about health and wealth? These are things that Williamson County nearly worships, right? If we're not careful, We can become to believe 
that if we are wealthy and that we are healthy, this is some sort of gold star from God for living an exemplary, superior Christian life. And then if we aren't healthy and we aren't wealthy, that somehow, somehow we are being punished for being a spiritual underachiever. Politics. I grew up in a church where my youth pastor, my pastor, my Sunday school teachers, my friends, even members of my family, they wanted me to think that I had to be as passionate about politics as they were, and I had to vote the way that they did. And most importantly, I had to be very ticked off at everybody who didn't, or else I was somehow broken spiritually. Now, government and family and kids and a wife and a husband, these are good gifts from God. But let's be careful that as we rejoice in these good things, we don't use them to reject our brothers and sisters. We should not rejoice as Americans do. We rejoice only in the Lord. And we should be grieved when others are excluded from full participation in the body of Christ because they haven't quite measured up to our expectations. Rejoice in the Lord, Paul says. Everything else is garbage. Look with me in verse (laughs) 4. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Now, Paul's not being arrogant here. He's being extremely sarcastic. It's one of his many spiritual gifts. Anybody else have the spiritual gift of sarcasm? Now, you got to be careful exercising that in the church these days because there aren't enough Christians with the gift of interpretation for the gift of sarcasm. But I just want to bless you and ask you to continue to exercise that gift. We need you. And the Apostle Paul had your same gift. The Apostle Paul is basically saying this. This is the New Groves International Version. Look, if you have to be a good you to be the best Christian, I'm the best there ever was. Compared to me, these Judaizers are just (laughs) Jew-ish. Paul considers his Jewish accomplishments. He looks back on all of his spiritual achievements at his vast religious resume, and he says, it is worthless compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. In verse 8, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. Now, this word garbage is an ancient Greek word, skubala. Why don't you guys say skubala with me? Scubula. Now, feel free to use that this week if you get stuck in traffic and you're frustrated or you step in a le- on a Lego on the way to the bathroom in the dead of night. It's a really good word to get, kind of get vent some of that energy, right? We used to think it was a curse word. When I went to school back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, I was taught that this was a very crass word your mama wouldn't want you to use for feces, But in the decades since then, we've now unearthed more Greek manuscripts and been able to study how this word was used. And it just refers generally to anything that is useless, and so it's being discarded. Trash, rubbish, garbage. It's actually a contraction, a shortened form of a phrase that is thrown to the dogs. And Paul says, I look at my superior resume at all of my accomplishments and accolades, and I now consider them to be worthless in comparison to the value of knowing Christ. So let the savage, snarling, roaming packs of Judaizers feast on that trash if they want it, but all I want is Jesus. Give me Christ alone, through faith alone. Paul says, I value Christ above all else because it is only through Christ that I experience a right relationship with God that he calls righteousness. A right relationship with God, it's a gift from God that we receive by placing our faith in the faithfulness of Christ. Let me say that again. A right relationship with God is a gift from God that we simply receive by placing our faith in the faithfulness of Christ. You see, only Christ 
was faithful to obey the law where I fail. Only Christ faithfully went to the cross that I couldn't bear. Only Christ, only Christ was crucified on Golgotha in my place. Only Christ broke out of that tomb that would have imprisoned me forever. So give me Christ. Give me Christ alone. Everything else is worthless. I went to church my whole life, but it wasn't until I was a teenager that I went to the cross. There's a difference. I got all the awards for memorizing the scripture. I'd been to vacation Bible school. I never missed a day of Sunday school. My dad was a deacon and sang in the choir. My mom was a Sunday school teacher. I went to camps and I went on mission trips. I even told other people about Jesus. I was baptized. And then a friend of mine sitting next to me in band class asked me, Sean, are you a Christian? I said, are you kidding me? Do you know who I am and what I have done? Bro, that's hurtful. But you know, his question stuck with me. It burrowed into my mind. It turned my heart upside down. And for weeks, I remember lying awake at night wondering, am I? It took weeks for me to finally come to the end of myself. And there in my bedroom to just fall on my knees and offer the most inadequate prayer I could. God, just save me. Jesus, save me. I was confident of only two things. I am a sinner, I am lost, and I am doomed. And a second thing, I can't save myself. Only Jesus can. Give me Jesus. Everything else is worthless. But Paul says, not only do I want a right relationship with Christ, but I want an intimate relationship with him too. Let's talk about knowing Christ. Knowing Christ, having received the righteousness that comes from God through faith, Paul then says in verse 10, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. This is an intimate relationship. It's not just facts and feelings. It's not just head knowledge. It's not just information, but it's a transformation of the whole person that comes from having a relationship with Christ. It's a very intimate word used here for know. It's used in the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures when it says that Adam knew his wife and she bore a child. This is the closest relationship we can have and we can have that kind of relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul wants an intimate relationship with Christ by living the life like Christ, by imitating his life. Through imitation, we gain intimacy. Through imitation, we gain intimacy. Now, one way of understanding the literary design of the letter to the Philippians is like this. Imagine the whole letter as a wheel, and the hub at the center of that wheel is a hymn that's sometimes called the Christ hymn. It's found in chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. This Christ hymn describes the life of Christ so beautifully and succinctly. It's at the center of the letter, and everything else that Paul says, it's constantly linking back, pointing back to this him at the very center. And so often if we want to understand the rest of the letter's content, we got to go back to this hub, this him in the middle, to gain a better understanding of what Paul has in mind. So when Paul says, I want to follow Jesus into resurrection power and suffering and death, we need to go back to the Christ hymn at the middle and see what did that look like in the life of Christ. So read with me. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. And your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And now the hymn begins. Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. 
He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And what we notice about the life of Christ as it's described in this hymn is that it is a U-shaped life. Notice this, that Christ begins in heaven, a place of honor and glory, and chooses to disadvantage himself, to descend in, into suffering and servitude before once again being exalted back to honor and glory. He goes up to go, he goes down to go up. This is the U-shaped Christ-like life descending into service and suffering and even death before ascending to life and glory. And Paul is pointing to this song as the kind of life we are to live and imitate if we want to know the surpassing worth of an intimate relationship with Christ. So let's talk about the two dimensions of this, of this knowing of Christ. First, we can know Christ in the power of, of the resurrection of Christ. And secondly, we'll know Christ by experiencing the suffering and death of Christ. So the resurrection power of Christ and in the suffering and death of Christ. Let's look at both of those. Now, it's strange that he lists resurrection first, isn't it? That he wants to know the resurrection power of Christ. It seems backwards. Like, how can you be resurrected before you've even died? It makes no sense. How are you going to know that, Paul? And theologians have debated this for centuries, but this is the consensus. That Paul is speaking about the resurrection power of Christ, the power that will raise us from the dead someday. He's saying that power of resurrection is reaching back from the future into history, meeting us in the now to bring resurrection to our lives today. That right now, the spirit that brings resurrection is in us and through us and for us. And we can know that power right now where we are. In Romans 8, chapter 11, Paul speaks about this resurrection power. He says, if the spirit of him who raised me, raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. And he's about to ask us to do some hard things. Paul's going to ask us to go to a place that we want to avoid. And he wants us to know we do not go there alone. But the resurrection power of the risen Lord goes with us. So have hope, take courage, press on. Frederick Douglass is a hero of mine, freed slave who became an abolitionist freeing others. In 1847, he made the long trip to Boston to speak to a crowd of fellow abolitionists to encourage them. You see, the tide was turning. It looked like they were making progress against the evil of slavery. And he was so excited to give them the good news, the advances in the movement. But on the way, the pendulum swung back. And the federal government annexed Texas, increasing the territories that would make slavery legal. Despairing, not knowing what to say or do. He went to a friend of his on his way to Boston and they came up with the only solution they could come to. There was no other way. They didn't see another way out. They had to call upon the slaves and their allies to take up arms and to violently overthrow and kill, if they must, the slave masters. It was the only other way. They were out of options. There was no hope. So when Frederick stepped onto the stage that night in Boston, he stumbled and he fumbled and he hemmed and he hawed and he struggled 
to put into words all that he was thinking and feeling and fearing until finally he collapsed. His head against the podium, his shoulders heaving, sobbing. And the crowd sat in stunned silence as their usual articulate silver-tongued inspiration was at a loss for words. They sat in silence until she stood up on the front row, a tree of a woman, six feet tall, rail thin, her body scarred by the years of dehumanizing abuse on the plantation. Sojourner truth. You couldn't miss her wearing a white turban and a white dress and waving a white shawl so that Frederick would catch her. And she shouted, Frederick, Frederick, is your God dead? Defeated leader raised his head from the podium, made eye contact with her. Stunned, not knowing what to say or do, a little afraid, and she shouted again. She did not let up. Frederick, is your God dead? He took a deep breath, collected himself, and said simply, no. And what came next, some people say, was the greatest speech that Frederick Douglass ever delivered. It seemed that his tongue was on fire that night, and the journalists who wrote about it declared that it was otherworldly. Of course it was. The resurrection power of Jesus Christ reached back from the future into the present and brought hope and healing and restoration and inspiration. And you know how the story ends. The scourge of slavery was eventually overthrown, and liberation began to come. Now, none of us are leaving this place to go free some slaves. <laughs> none of us are going to step in front of a crowd tomorrow that is dejected and despairing. But I've sat with tears in my eyes as tears flooded yours. And you told me that he left. The crib is still empty. The test came back and the cancer has returned. That you're at the end of your rope with your kid. You just don't know what else you can say and do. That the job is gone and the bills are due. And I want you to know this morning that the resurrection power of Jesus reaches back into the present, and that your God is not dead. And as long as Jesus lives, hope lives. Hope lives. Amen. So we know, we know Jesus by experiencing his resurrection power in our life. At the end of our service today, our prayer team is going to be down front. And listen, you can cry out to God to bring power and resurrection to your life anywhere, anytime, and any way you want. But we're here to help you if you just need some words. You just need a friend, someone to storm the gates of heaven alongside you. We're here. We will be here, and we will stay as long as we need to. So please come. Let us pray with you. We believe that God can bring hope and healing to your life. But Paul goes on. He calls us now to a place that we want to avoid. We go with the spirit of resurrection coming with us, and he asks us to go into the suffering and the death of Jesus because there we can experience Christ. Let's go back to the Christ hymn in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 7. It says, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. 
And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Paul calls us, he calls us to suffer the suffering of Christ. Now, there's lots of suffering in the world. Things hurt us and grieve us all the time, but this isn't about a sickness or persecution or the betrayal of a friend. This is suffering, this is sacrifice that we choose in order to benefit others. This is disadvantaging ourselves for the advantage of others. It's suffering with and alongside those who are suffering. You could call it compassion, which comes from the Latin words calm and passion. Calm meaning together or with, and passion meaning suffering. We are called to suffer with, to suffer with, to suffer for the benefit of others, to take stock of all the advantages we have and choose to divest ourselves of those advantages for the benefit of others. This is the suffering of Christ. This is what Christ has done for us, stepping out of the luxuries of heaven into the slum of humanity to buy us back from sin and death. Paul uses the same word for suffering in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 6. If we are suffering, it is, notice, for your comfort and salvation. In Colossians 1.24, the same thing happens. Now, I rejoice in what I am suffering for you. And I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. Suffer for others. That's the suffering of Christ. That's where we gain an intimate knowledge of Christ. In Mark chapter 8, stunning Stunning story. Jesus gathers his inner circle of disciples and he tells them, I'm about to go to Jerusalem. They're going to arrest me. They're going to kill me. I'm going to lay down my life for the world. And Peter pulls him aside and says, hey, no, it doesn't have to, I'm not gonna let you do that. I'm not gonna let you go and suffer and sacrifice for us. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Anyone who promises the Christian a life of comfort, endless happiness, and pleasure is doing the work of the devil and not speaking for the God of Scripture. Then Jesus says this, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What did he say that we have to do? Not some people, but all people, anyone who wants to become a disciple of Christ must first deny themselves, die to their own desires, their own ambitions, their own satisfaction and comfort. Deny yourself and take up your cross. I love this quote by Glenn Packie. I'm going to put it in my office. You know, I can look at it on the hard days. A disciple is one who actually gets on their cross, not one who simply believes in the cross or is grateful for Jesus' cross, but gets on their cross. Who are you suffering for? We're all suffering. We're all sacrificing every day. The typical American suffering is to work 40 to 60 hours a week for decades on end so that we can put our kids into a good school, so that they can get a good job, so that they can put their kids in a good school, so they can afford a good job, so they can put their kids in school, so they can get a good job, so they can put, you get it? That's what we are typically suffering for, but Jesus has more for you. There is a need out there with your name on it, and God has deposited into your possession a wealth of advantages. Will you suffer for them? Will you live the U-shaped life and descend 
into servitude for the glory of your God. It's hard to know what that might look like, I know. You don't have to go on the mission field to some remote part of the world. It could start just right next door. A woman who lives alone and you know her grass is overgrown and you could be the one who sacrifices a little sweat to make her yard beautiful again. It's that coworker who's really struggling and there's not much you can give, but you could sacrifice a few minutes to just be a listening ear. It's that person that hurt you long ago and you hate to see them coming, but you could sacrifice your pride and be the first one to say, I am sorry. I love you. Let's make things right. It could begin right here in this church this Sunday morning that you could give up a bit of your time, your talent, your resources to be able to serve in the parking lot or be the first friendly face someone sees when they come in the door or to be a big brother or a big sister to someone in our student ministry or our children's ministry or to lead a community group. Who will you suffer for this week? Go in the power of the resurrected Jesus. Let's pray. God, we thank you for speaking to us this morning through your word. And we simply offer you every advantage we have. And we ask you, God, show us the need that has our name on it this week. And spirit of resurrection, come in and accompany us as we go out to meet that need. We know it's gonna be hard, but we know we don't go along alone. And we just thank you, God, for going with us. But most of all, God, we wanna end this morning by celebrating the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus. Thank you, thank you for sending him into our lives to save us, to give us life. Thank you for giving us the gift of intimate relationship with your son. We love you, God. We praise you, God. We thank you, God. And we stand now to worship you. When you stand with us. I survey the wondrous cross on which the
team are down the front here. And I know that there are people in the room right now who are suffering. You're carrying it right now. And if you would like to pray with someone calling on the resurrection power of Jesus, then I'd invite you to come down and pray with someone. They would love to pray with you. It would be their honour to pray with you. They have been preparing their hearts to go before the throne on your behalf. So I would encourage you to do that. Can we thank Sean for opening God's Word today? Thank you. Just pondering what it might look like for thousands of us to be dispatched from this place, to be called, to show compassion, to be suffering on behalf of other people. I believe the Spirit of God is gonna speak to you about how to do that. Now we're about to do one of the coolest things we've ever done as a church. And I believe it is the beginning of a whole new chapter for us. I just uh, met all of the vendors that are out there waiting right now. And they are so excited and they're so grateful. That, uh, several of them were like, I can't believe that you're just allowing us to come and, and do this. You know, we're not charging them anything. They're keeping all the money and, and they're just so excited. Some of them, this is the first event that they've ever done with their brand new business. So they're nervous. Listen, we need to show up. We need to buy their food. We need to tip generously, amen. Let's show them how supportive we are of them. Let's go and have some fellowship together. This is gonna be a great time out on the East Lawn. Let's go. May the grace and peace of Jesus be with you. Amen.